Today we take a detailed look at one of the first compacts introduced by the Detroit automakers, and that is the 1961-63 Oldsmobile F85. Now, as I said, this was one of the first compacts that was introduced by Detroit automakers. There were others, including at General Motors, there was, of course, the Corvair, which came out in 1960. But for 1961, other compact cars came out across various General Motors divisions, including the Pontiac Tempest, which had a number of strange features, and we've already covered that vehicle, but take a look at the review in the comments section to learn more about everything on that vehicle, including its slant four-cylinder, its rope drive shaft, and transaxle as well, with the transmission mounted in the rear. To this Oldsmobile F85, to the Buick Special. But the Olds, I think, is one little special vehicle, in part because it has just charming styling, and there's so much to cover beyond the video that we did with Mark on his 1961 F85, because we're going to cover the 1961 to 63, the entire generation right now. So let's get started. One of the first questions to ask is why would Oldsmobile even introduce a small car in the marketplace in any event? Well, Recall that by the late 1950s, Oldsmobile was actually seeing its sales take a hit. In particular, it went from being in fourth place of sales rankings for 1958 to sixth place in 1959. And that just wasn't acceptable for Oldsmobile's management. And beyond that, this was a time period where Americans were really starting to discover small cars, whether it was from foreign or domestic automakers. On the domestic front, by this point, there was obviously the Studebaker Lark and, of course, American Motors Rambler. And those sold quite well and customers tended to like them. Of course, the Lark didn't end up saving Studebaker, but the Rambler was very popular. In any case, General Motors wanted its part of the action and Oldsmobile did as well. And they thought that it could help propel sales, particularly during this time frame when some of the lower end vehicles from Chevrolet, Plymouth, as well as Ford were starting to offer more luxury goodies and kind of crowding out the mid-priced vehicles like Oldsmobile, Buick, Mercury, and Pontiac, etc. So, the 1961 F85 was born. Once the decision to enter the market space was made, then the next question was, well, how are these vehicles going to be produced and upon what platform? As I mentioned, Chevrolet had introduced the Corvair in 1960, and there were some within the corporation who really just wanted to badge engineer the Corvair across the other divisions. Well, of course, that wouldn't work in the eyes of the general managers of those other divisions. And so they came up with a unique platform, the so-called Y platform, that was different from the Corvair's Z platform in a number of ways. Of course, the first was that these vehicles would be front engine rear drive. They wouldn't have an air-cooled six-cylinder out back, and they also wouldn't have the rear independent suspension that the Corvairs had. These instead would be front engine rear drive vehicles riding atop a 112 inch wheelbase, a few more inches than the Corvair, and measuring about 188 inches in overall length. There was a period of time where it was not yet decided that the vehicles would be front engine rear drive, and in fact, Oldsmobile had prototypes running around that had transversely mounted engine and transmissions up front driving the front wheels. It was later decided that that was just too radical of a change for the average American consumer. And so Oldsmobile and Buick, as well as Pontiac, although they had a different setup with the rear transaxle, stuck with front engine rear drive. The vehicles would also be based atop a unibody platform. In other words, there was not a separate body and frame. The body and frame were integral in this particular vehicle, and that decision was one that didn't necessarily warm the cockles of all the engineers' hearts over at Oldsmobile Division. Some preferred to have the body and frame separate for purposes of isolation as well as comfort. But the decision was made primarily based on cost that these vehicles were going to employ a unibody platform. Another interesting decision was made was that similar to the 1959 full-size vehicles that shared the front door of the Buick across the entire General Motors lineup, that these vehicles would also share the front doors as well as the windshields, the side glass, and the rear glass, as well as the roof panel. The divisions could style the fenders, the hood, the grill, the rear quarters, and the trunk, but they had to use the doors 
across all models. And these doors in these vehicles have pretty interesting styling, kind of uh, out in, out in surfacing to them that you can imagine was somewhat challenging for designers to employ and also make the cars look different because they had to blend in all the other pieces of sheet metal to that door. But I think they did so quite successfully in that the Olds and the Buick look very different and the Pontiac also looks very different too. Underhood, an all-new aluminum block V8 would be employed underhood in the Olds and the Buicks as well as optional in the Pontiacs. It displays 215 cubic inches and made 155 horsepower breathing through a two-barrel carburetor with 8.75 to 1 compression ratio. There was an optional four-barrel carburetor that could go on top of this engine, and that gave it a bit more compression. It, instead of being 8.75 to 1 compression, was then 10.25 to 1, and that yielded 185 horsepower. This was an interesting little V8 in a number of areas. The first is that, as I said, it was an aluminum block, and the block allegedly weighed just 50 pounds, and fully dressed, it weighed a little under 350 pounds, so very light under hood overall. The second interesting piece of information about this engine was that while Oldsmobile and Buick had the same 215 cubic inch V8, or seemingly same V8 as standard equipment in their compacts, Oldsmobile, of course, had to do a little bit something different to this 215 cubic inch V8 because, after all, it was Oldsmobile. Back in a Motor Trend test report, Motor Trend reported that some of the variations included the combustion chamber configuration, which Motor Trend said is patterned after the standard Oldsmobile V8 with wedge chambers, and other changes were made versus the Buick V8 in terms of the design of the pistons, rocker arms, valves, as well as the squish and quench area in the combustion chamber. Other differences included the valve springs, which were cone shape, and Oles employed that because they felt they had a higher frequency response and also a built-in dampening effect. Oles also had a strange feature on their so-called Rocket V8. Yes, this was not the Rocket V8 under hood in these vehicles. It was the Rocket V8 because I guess it was small, uh, and that is that on the standard two-barrel version, the air cleaner encompassed the entire carburetor all the way down to its base. I have never seen this on a domestic vehicle before or since, and I think the idea was that you would get cold air circulating around the carburetor or colder air circulating around the carburetor so that it would help with things like vapor lock, etc., and that was only true on the two-barrel Rocket V8. The four-barrel had a more conventional air cleaner. Well, for whatever reason, Buick didn't employ that air cleaner design on its two-barrel 215 cubic inch V8, and no other General Motors V8 employed it, so I guess it didn't work out all that well. In fact, perhaps it even trapped heat under the carburetor because the bottom part of the air cleaner was basically getting radiant heat from the intake and then creating perhaps even more heat in that area where the carburetor was trying to operate. But in any case, if you want to impress your friends, this is, I think, the only engine that I know of, carbureted engine, that has this air cleaner that encompasses the entire carburetor, certainly from General Motors. Another interesting tidbit is that the wing nut location with respect to that air cleaner is actually off-center. It's not in the center of the air cleaner. Why they did that, I don't know. I guess that was just something for packaging reasons. In any case, the 215 V8 was actually a pretty good little V8 overall. It didn't have the issues that other aluminum block engines had that General Motors would subsequently introduce, like the Vega four-cylinder engine in 1971, presumably because that didn't have cast iron sleeves like this V8. And the HT4100 engine that Cadillac introduced in 1982 also just had a slew of issues for many, many different reasons. But this little 215 was actually a pretty good V8. In fact, it was later sold to Rover and became the basis for a very famous V8 overseas and powered Rover vehicles all the way into the early 2000s. So it had a lot of good attributes to it. This, by the way, was also the V8 that spawned the cast iron version of the Buick V6 that later became and evolved into the 3800. So there was a lot to like about this little V8. Unfortunately, the same could not be said of the automatic transmission that was used in the Oldsmobile version of this vehicle. 
And that was the infamous, and infamous is the right term, rotohydromatic transmission. Now, the rotohydromatic was developed by Oldsmobile as a lighter weight, more compact design. And you can see here in this undercarriage shot of the 1961 F85 just how compact the transmission was, which was great for overall packaging because it made the transmission hump in the floor plan uh, much reduced and smaller. So you had more interior space. But with that reduction in the size of the transmission came a reduction in its longevity. And these rotohydromatics, particularly the ones that were employed in the small F85 versus the ones employed in the full-size Oldsmobiles. Yes, full-size Oldsmobiles also employed this transmission, though a different version of it. And the short wheelbase full-size Pontiacs, like the Catalina, also employed it for a number of years, not the long wheelbase Pontiacs like the Bonneville. But in any case, the transmission just was not great. Oldsmobile called it a four-speed because they counted the torque multiplication that apparently was variable in first gear uh, as two different gears. But really, it was a three-speed, and these transmissions are just horribly clunky. And if you drive a vehicle with it, you'll notice that the 1-2 shift is very, very clunky. The 2-3 is okay. But what's effectively happening on the first and second shift is not only is the gear ratio changing, but also the transmission is effectively engaging full mechanical lockup. And then when you go into third, it's more of a conventional shift, but the full mechanical lockup in part goes away, and I believe it's only 60% locked up and 40% slippage in uh, the third gear ratio on these transmissions. So you drive one, and the best impression I can have of the engine and what it does when you drive one when you're accelerating normally is this. That's the one, two, three shift right there. And hopefully you love that impression. In any case, like I said, it just was not durable at all. It did have the accelerator action that was supposed to help it get off the line. That was a 22-vein rotor that speeds your response and moved you into economical direct drive within seconds, which was second gear. But, well, it failed. So there went the economy that you saved in terms of fuel mileage because you had to repair the transmission. In any event, as I mentioned, that transmission did give the Olds F85 and its siblings a bit more interior room. But there were other elements that made this four-door sedan look pretty airy on the inside, and that was the toothpick A pillars and B pillars. It was a sedan after all, didn't have frameless door glass. And the old stylus, I think, made the most handsome use of the shared components that they had to deal with. Recall, as I said, that these vehicles shared doors, glass, roof panels, etc. So the designers really had the front and rear clips of the vehicles to work with on styling. And the Olds had this kind of nice flare-up in the fenders and the quarter panels, kind of like a Stingray style look to it in the front and rear. And the 1961 F85, I think, is just a great looking front end with this vertical bar grill and, you know, just a beautiful mid-century modern block lettering in the middle of it. The styling would evolve as time would go on. For 1962, I think it was a bit less handsome. It still had that Stingray style look up front, but the grill was different now, and as opposed to having that vertical bar grill that terminated in the Oldsmobile block lettering beneath it, you had Oldsmobile block lettering on the hood and a complete vertical bar grill, complete with the Tesla symbol, which was introduced in 1961 on the F85. I'm not quite sure what Oldsmobile was thinking. I guess it's a little rocket, uh, if you will, that looks very similar to the modern day Tesla logo. And in between the 1961 and 62 model years, there were two-door F85s that were added. And there was a deluxe model of the F85 and four-door sedan, but the deluxe model of the two-door was given a name that many of us would recognize and that would go on to become very popular in Olds history, and that is Cutlass. The Cutlass got a number of extra features. It came with the 185-horsepower four-barrel Rocket V8, had 3.36 to 1 rear end ratio. It also had a number of interior appointments that gave it some deluxe feeling. So the Cutlass was introduced on this lineup partway through the 1961 model year, and as I said, it went on to increasing popularity. In 1962, Oldsmobile also introduced a special version of this vehicle called the Jetfire. It was actually the first turbocharged vehicle in America produced by 
U.S. automakers, it beat out the Corvair Monza Spider by roughly one or two months. But the Jetfire took the 215 cubic inch V8 under hood. And remember, they made 155 or 185 horsepower, depending upon if they had two or four barrel carburation and lower high compression. But the Jetfire's engine made 215 horsepower and 300 pound-feet of torque. And it did so with that turbocharging, and you also had to make sure that you included turbo rocket fuel in your Jetfire in order to ensure that the engine didn't have a lot of detonation when the turbocharger spooled up. This shaved about two seconds off of the 0-60 to time, and the vehicles with the Jetfire engine were able to hit 60 miles an hour in a little under 9 seconds as opposed to around 11 and a half seconds. So, not too bad. And in its last year in this body style, 1963, the F-85 was refreshed yet again with all new sheet metal aside from the roof panel, the glass up front, the backlights, the door glass, etc. And got a much more conventional slab-sided look. Not exactly my favorites for 1963, but as I said, more conventional. And kind of preparing the car for becoming a more conventional midsizer as it would become in 1964. 1963 would also be the last year for this aluminum V8 before General Motors would shelve it and eventually sell it to Rover. In 1964, the F85 lineup would transition to being body on frame from unibody, and the base engine would become the Buick Special V6, and you could select various Oldsmobile V8s in that particular vehicle as well. So 61 to 63 is a very special year for these F85s, and the Cutlass, as I mentioned, is in its introduction. The sales were okay for these vehicles. In 1961, Oldsmobile sold about 76,000 F85s and Cutlasses across the lineup. 1962, they sold 95,000. In 1963, they sold about 120,000. So sales were increasing each year as customers increasingly accepted these small Oldsmobiles as really good vehicles by and large, aside from their transmissions. Hope you enjoyed the spotlight on the 61 to 63 F85 and Cutlass. And if you did, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.